Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Exceptional Conservative Show. We are live from the nation's capital. That's Washington, D.C., the you and me. Home to those who wish to remain anonymous when it comes to their voting record. However, it shines like a light to the rest of the world. Uh, Mary Brockman, my bouncer in chief in the chat room. Mrs. Biggs, smooches to both of you. So much for being in there and watching tonight. Uh, we're going to have a great conversation in just a few with Hannah Cox. She is the national manager for conservatives concerned about the death penalty. Uh, and as well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to encourage you all to make certain that you have a conversation at CPAC. And I, I, it was shared by a lot of people who watched around the world, uh, watch us uh, for the first time cover CPAC cover to cover, uh, the first minority group to do that in television. Um, and now I wanted to bring that in a more intimate setting uh, with the fam, with the family tonight. Hannah Cox, thank you. What is the purpose, the vision, the mission, the values, all that stuff about conservatives concerned about the death penalty? Sure. So Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty has been around for about seven years, and we were founded by a group of conservatives in Montana who felt very strongly about their pro-life views, but also felt that to be consistent, that meant being pro-life all the way from birth through death. And so they started advocating against the death penalty on that basis and actually started finding that they had a bit more Republican support in the legislature than they initially thought. Uh, from there, the movement took off. Other states wanted to have chapters, and so we went national about seven years ago. And we predominantly work just to educate people on the right side of the spectrum about the issues we see with the death penalty and why we think that capital punishment does not align with conservative values. Now, seven years, and a, a lot of people have been watching you all. You're in Tennessee, you're in Missouri, you're in at least several other states. Uh, and recently you had some success in some northern state. If you could tell us about that. Sure. So since we started studying this issue in 2000, it was virtually unheard of for a Republican to sponsor death penalty repeal legislation. Yeah. Since we were founded in 2012, we've seen that number skyrocket. Uh, Ten times the amount of Republican lawmakers were introducing bills by 2016. Uh, this year has continued that trajectory. We actually have eight states that have Republican-led efforts to repeal the death penalty, and we are anticipating two more within the next week. Uh, last year, New Hampshire passed death penalty repeal legislation out of two Republican-controlled chambers and then fell only two votes shy of veto override majority. They have been moving full steam ahead this session. They already passed it through their House with a veto-proof majority, and we'll be voting on it in their Senate at the end of the month, so we expect them to uh, get that kind of finally done this year. Now, Hannah, a lot of people would say, wow, that's that's absolutely wonderful. That's great. Whoa, slow down. Um, you know, let let a couple of wins, you know, and then wait a few years and, and try again someplace else. Why are you all so fervent? What is what is moving or what what spirit are you all getting that says that this is the right time, the right season, the right place? to get this done in terms of abolishing the death penalty in America? Well, for me, I have to speak personally here. The reason I predominantly changed my viewpoint on the death penalty a number of years ago was because of the innocence issues within the system. We know that 164 people have been exonerated from death row in this country. That's one person for every 10 executions so far. And that number doesn't even include people who have been released over potential innocence issues or had their trials reversed. It doesn't also include the 870 something people who have been wrongfully convicted of homicides, but were lucky enough to not get a death sentence. So there are overwhelming issues with innocence in our system. Uh, based on those numbers alone, I'm positive there are still innocent people on death row. So the clock is ticking to some extent. I think that uh, that definitely motivates us to keep moving quickly. But I will say also, I think what you're seeing right now in terms of the number of Republican lawmakers carrying bills is uh, hopefully the fruits of our labor. You know, we've been laying the groundwork for many years now. We've been educating people for some time. And, and one of my favorite quotes is, I don't know who said it, but I always re-quote it, says that support of the death penalty runs a mile wide and an inch deep. And I think that's because for most people, they really have not thought that deeply into the system or been um, around it that much. And so once they start to actually look into it and see how it's working in practice, you do see support tend to wane pretty quickly. And I think that what's happening right now is that criminal justice reform as a whole is sort of hitting a crescendo within this country. We're seeing people on both sides recognize that the policies we've been applying for the past several decades aren't working. We've locked up a lot of people. We've spent bukus of money. We still have very high violent crime rates. 
at that point, you have to recognize that something needs to change and we need to try something else. And so I think for people who are looking at the criminal justice system and seeing those problems, you don't walk away and say, well, I'm sure the death penalty is fine, though. You know, so I think yeah. it's, it's a factor that is related to that as well. Well, you, you, um, in terms of your earlier statement that there is a consistency, if we are fighting to keep babies alive as persons, then we should be fighting to keep criminals alive as persons. Is that the consistency that you're speaking to? I think so. And this plays back into my Christian faith, but I think that all humans have dignity that is inherent and it cannot be won or lost. I think your life as a human has value because you are a child of God and you can do something terrible and you should be held accountable if you do something terrible. But I don't think that you lose that human value. And I think that there's a problem in our society when we operate under the notion that you can. And I think that that disregard for life leads to disregard of other um, phases in life. Now, in the sense of the, the death penalty, um, and, and this is, and, and we were very cordial with one another, uh, and, and as well, any discussion, any decorum should be in terms of discussion of death penalty, because this is a very serious topic matter. But for individuals who have had victims of their families, uh, and uh, my family has been victimized by a, a number of a, a serial killer as well as gang members. Um, isn't there a point where the death penalty is just uh, for the actions that have taken place uh, against society and against uh, a family? Yeah, and I think, you know, first and foremost, I so appreciate your willingness and remain very sorry for your losses. When it comes to murder victims' family members, I think they should always be at the forefront of these conversations. Um, and I think that we can in no way speak for all murder victims' family members. They, there are so many different nuances to how different victims re uh, relate to these things as they happen to them. What I can say is that we do work with a large contingency of murder victims' family members who are opposed to the death penalty, who either feel that the system re-traumatized their grief, um, others felt that their wishes were not respected by their prosecutors, some actually were in favor of the death penalty and then changed their mind after having gone through the system and really recognizing that they did not feel that it provided them closure. Um, and really, actually, there were more victim services that would have actually helped them rebuild their lives in a, a more productive way. I just respect that. I, I will point out to one other group, though, that I think gets overlooked here quite a bit in this topic. And that are the victims' family members whose relatives criminal or perpetrator was never caught for their crime. And that's actually a lot of people in this country. We only have a 51% clearance rate for homicides. So that means 49% of victim family members get no justice, get no closure, get no sort of peace at all. And the death penalty and the cost that it entails contributes to that. Exactly. And I'm part of that particular group that you speak of. Uh, which uh, it's been five years, and normally in most cases uh, regarding resolving uh, murders, if you don't solve it within the next 48 hours, the likelihood of it ever being solved is quite difficult, although there are exceptions to that particular rule. And just like I believe in this particular case, I believe that they should be given the death penalty. Uh, say, for instance, the general, gentleman, Brendan Tarrant, uh, in New Zealand, who kills 49 people, uh, the gang members that constantly get away with their uh, madness uh, and reproaches against society. Uh, you believe that there is a hope of rehabilitation. I believe so too, but I also believe that when acts are done so heinously that they are virtually subject to a death penalty. Uh, would you agree or disagree with that, that vein of thought? I would, I would agree with you, actually. I don't think that I changed my stance on the death penalty because I don't think that it's ever appropriate or because I don't see that there's justice in it in some way. Rather, I changed my opinion on it because you have to either support the system as it is, as a whole, and how it's currently operating or not. And in reality, when you get into it, how it's actually functioning, to me, the way it's functioning is not worth risking innocent lives. It's not worth the cost that we're spending. It's not worth those opportunity costs where we could be diverting resources to programs that actually deter crime and also to solving more cold cases. Um, so it's not something where I say this, you know, there's no line someone could cross where perhaps they are deserving of it, but rather that the cost of the system and the uh, fallibility of it is not worth the risk of what we're using it for. Exactly. Now, you mentioned in our conversation 
uh, at CPAC, uh, that the death penalty being used as a deterrent, or at least you were paraphrasing conversations you had with law enforcement. Uh, and I, I don't see a penalty as any form of deterrent. I, I see a penalty as a result of the game that you played. Uh, you're, playing, you're playing God with other people's lives, and then you come to the bearing that you are not God. Um, do law enforcement officials believe that the death penalty or going to jail is a deterrent uh, in our society? And, and if so, why is it ineffectual? So they don't believe that and statistics back them up. We can look at data from various regions and states of the country. And we know that, uh, in fact, there's a correlation that states that continue to use it the most continue to have very high violent crime rates, whereas states that do not use it or that repeal it typically see their crime rates either maintain or even drop. Um, law enforcement agree that this is not a deterrent because they do not think that criminals think about the punishment when acting. You're typically either acting in a crime of passion um, under some sort of a mental illness or instability, or someone is being very methodical and planning out their crime, in which case they typically do not anticipate that they will be caught. Criminologists also agree with that. So police chiefs actually say that the death penalty is the least effective tool they have in their toolkit for actually effectively making communities safer. And they say the number one thing they really need are more resources. Yeah, and see, this is where I have a, a disagreement uh, with law enforcement officials. Um, uh, the whole idea of using jail as a deterrent. Um, jail was never meant to be a deterrent. Jail was meant to, well, if done in a more just way, was meant to be used as a place uh, to house individuals for a short period of time, depending on their crime, or long period of time, depending on their crime, uh, for acts against society, that they were a risk to our society. Um, I, I don't know how locking up a man for all of eternity uh, is going to deter someone, just like I don't know how a death penalty would deter someone. I believe it is a crime and that there's a penalty for every crime. Should not individuals be trained that criminals uh, will suffer the penalties for the actions that they take? I, I'm still a very tough on crime person in this way. I think people should be held accountable for their actions. And I certainly think when someone is proven to be an ongoing threat to society, that they should be incarcerated for life. And I think that we have mechanisms to ensure that people who are in that category will never get out. And so for me, that is sufficient. And as you said, I don't think that prison was meant to be a deterrent either. I think it was meant to make sure a dangerous person was kept away from society predominantly. And then in cases where that person is going to be re-entering society, as the majority of people who enter prison will, then in those cases, jail and prison should be a, a program where we are getting to the root causes of crime and ensuring that when they come back out, they are on the path to being productive members of society again and will not continue to recommit crimes. Um, I think that's very important that we have a justice system that's structured in that manner. I don't think we currently do have a justice system that is predominantly structured in that manner. I think we typically are very focused on um, getting some sort of closure or retribution. And I think to some extent, that's something that has to be left to God. I don't know that mankind is actually capable of extracting that uh, in an effective and in a way that doesn't endanger innocent people and also re-victimize others. Yes, exactly. Tonight we're talking with Hannah Cox. Uh, and she is one of the great leaders in the movement to abolish the death penalty in America. She's with conservatives concerned about the death penalty. She's a national manager. Uh, and although she hangs out with John Crane, I forgive her. Uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of the overall viewpoint, I can understand your perspectives. Um, but my perspective is one in which there are some things that should be done to make it a more just system. I want you to speak to the number of individuals who are on death row uh, and what's, what matters they face in terms of their processes. Yes, I think we can absolutely agree on that base fact. And I think if you look at death row populations, that's another thing that typically really surprises people. Most people say, I support the death penalty, but only for the worst of the worst. Well, first of all, that's subjective. Um, but second of all, even if you could quantify that, 
that's really not what is the basis for determining for who gets a death sentence or not in this country. The largest determinant is actually where a person lives. And that's because the use of the death penalty is so highly concentrated. We know that the majority of cases uh, come from only 2% of counties and all executions since reinstatement have come from less than 16% of counties. So that's your biggest driver right there. Mm -hmm. The second largest determinant is whether or not you can afford a good attorney. We see death rows that are filled with people who have offenders. On Texas's death row alone, one in four people had a public defender that was later disbarred or disciplined. Uh, in North Carolina, I think it's 73% of their death row inmates were sentenced before there was an indigent defense fund. The fact of the matter is we have two different justice systems, one for people who have money and wealth and one for people who do not. That's not justice. Um, I think that that's really problematic when you're looking at all of the representation issues that go on on death row and the socioeconomic disparities for who gets sentenced and who doesn't. And then thirdly, there are a lot of racial bias issues within um, the race of the victim. You typically see people who have a white victim are much more likely to get the death penalty than someone who has a victim that was black or who was Hispanic. To me, on a very moral basis, that's disturbing. That says to me that in this country, we value victims differently. And I have a real problem with that. I think it's an ethical persons who are Democrat socialists are the ones who are purportedly putting people away and creating gun control areas, which purports a greater uh, share of the offenses, the heinous offenses. Uh, would there be a correlation between Democrat areas and as well, the same correlations that you see uh, on, on the death row uh, listings? It would be really interesting to study. I actually don't know, really speaking, you have seen that a lot of these tough on crime policies were driven by inner city politicians and areas that typically were higher minorities. And I think that, again, you've seen that backfire. We've seen the ramifications of that over three decades worth of data now to look back at how those policies have worked. And they simply have not. They've not worked. And I would argue that one reason you continue to see very high violent crime rates in areas that use death penalty the most is, again, because of the amount of money they're spending on the death penalty. If you look at a death penalty case, you are spending vastly more than you would before life without parole. Um, that is not only money that is going out the window as far as not being a deterrent or really producing anything at the end of the day for the money spent, but it's also money that's not going, again, to programs that actually could deter crime or towards giving that money to police officers and departments so they could actually solve more crimes. You know, uh, there is room for us all uh, at the table for discussions. Uh, and I, 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 after speaking with you and, and John, and you know I have a great affinity for John, uh, Crane. Um, there are things that I do think about in terms of death penalty now that I didn't think about before, although my opinion of it has not changed because of my basis for it. But I really, really thank you for being willing to hold that conversation with me uh, as eloquently and as graceful as you have done, uh, where we can agree to disagree, but at least we can reveal the principles by which we believe. Uh, without it necessarily being in civil. How can people get in contact with what you do uh, for the opportunity of spreading the hope of abolishing the death penalty in the United States of America? Well, first I'd say thank you, Ken. That's a very sweet compliment. I have to send it right back towards you. You're a wonderful conversationalist and I always enjoy speaking with you. you. Um, people can get involved at conservativesconcern.org. That's our website. You can see a listing of our chapters there. You can get on our email list. You can contact us if you want to get more involved in specific ways. Um, again, that's conservativesconcerned.org. And people can also check us out on social media at our acronym, which is CCATDP. Hannah, we look forward to you coming back because there's still a lot of things that we need to talk about. And we were just broaching the tip of the iceberg regarding crime reform uh, and as well uh, making the field even in the courtroom for both the victim as well as the culprit. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Hannah Cox with us this particular evening. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. God bless you too. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you have enjoyed that conversation. There will be more conversation I have with some of the issues that are coming up around uh, the country. Howie Coleman, private investigator extraordinaire, will be with us uh, along with Rocky D. Yes, there is no radio free unless it's radio free Rocky D. RockyD.com. We'll be talking about issues and concerns, and we again want to thank Hannah Cox. 
just a, she's the sweetest young lady in the world. She really is. Uh, and you all need to get in contact with her. A conservative is concerned about the death penalty, uh, CCA uh, TDP. Uh, we'll be right back with more of the best at Urban Conservative Talk right after this message, ladies and gentlemen.